Even the carbon dioxide theory is not new. The basic idea was first precisely stated in 1861 by the noted British physicist John Tyndall. He attributed climatic temperature changes to variations in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. According to the theory, carbon dioxide controls temperature because the carbon dioxide molecules in the air absorb infrared radiation. The carbon dioxide and other gases in the atmosphere are virtually transparent to the visible radiation that delivers the sun's energy to the earth. But the earth in turn radiates much of the energy in the invisible infrared region of the spectrum. This radiation is most intense at wavelengths very close to the principal absorption band. 13 to 17 microns, of the carbon dioxide spectrum. When the carbon dioxide concentration is sufficiently high, even its weaker absorption bands become effective, and a greater amount of infrared radiation is absorbed. Because the carbon dioxide blanket prevents its escape into space, the trapped radiation warms up the atmosphere. A familiar instance of this greenhouse effect is the heating up of a closed automobile when it stands for a while in the summer sun. Like the atmosphere, the car's windows are transparent to the sun's visible radiation, which warms the upholstery and metal inside the car. These materials in turn re-emit some of their heat as infrared radiation. Glass, like carbon dioxide, absorbs some of this radiation and thus traps the heat, and the temperature inside the car rises. Water vapor and ozone, as well as carbon dioxide, have this effect because they too absorb energy in the infrared region. But the climatic effects due to carbon dioxide are almost entirely independent of the amount of these other two gases. For the most part their absorption bands occur in different regions of the spectrum. In addition, nearly all water vapor remains close to the ground, while carbon dioxide diffuses more evenly through the atmosphere. Thus throughout most of the atmosphere carbon dioxide is the main factor determining changes in the radiation flux. The 2.3 by 1,012, 2,300 billion tons of carbon dioxide in the Earth's present atmosphere constitute some 0.03% of its total mass. The quantity of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is determined by the amount supplied and withdrawn from three other great reservoirs, oceans, rocks and living organisms. The oceans contain some 1.3 by 1,014 tons of carbon dioxide about 50 times as much as the air. Some of the gas is dissolved in the water, but most of it is present in carbonate compounds. The oceans exchange about 200 billion tons of carbon dioxide with the atmosphere each year. When the equilibrium is disturbed, the oceans may engulf or disgorge billions of additional tons of carbon dioxide. This puts a damper on the fluctuations in the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere. When the atmospheric concentration rises, the oceans tend to absorb much of the excess, when it fails, the oceanic reservoir replenishes it. Both the atmosphere and the oceans continuously exchange carbon dioxide with rocks and with living organisms. They gain carbon dioxide from the volcanic activity that releases gases from the Earth's interior and from the respiration and decay of organisms. They lose carbon dioxide to the weathering of rock and the photosynthesis of plants. As these processes change pace, the content of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere also changes, shifting the radiation balance and raising or lowering the Earth's temperature. In a nutshell, water takes a lot of energy to heat up, and air doesn't contain much. In fact, on a volume, volume basis, the ratio of heat capacities is about 3300 to 1. This means that to heat 1 liter of water by 1 C it would take 3300 liters of air that was 2 C hotter, or 1 liter of air that was about 3300 C hotter. This shouldn't surprise anyone. If you ran a cold bath and then tried to heat it by putting a dozen heaters in the room, does anyone believe that the water would ever get hot? The problem gets even stickier when you consider the size of the ocean. Basically, there is too much water and not enough air. The ocean contains a colossal 1 sextillion 500 quintillion liters of water. To heat it, 
even by a small amount, takes a staggering amount of energy. To heat it by a mere one C, for example, an astonishing six septillion joules of energy are required. Let's put this amount of energy in perspective. If we all turned off all our appliances and went and lived in caves, and then devoted every coal, nuclear, gas, hydro, wind and solar power plant to just heating the ocean, it would take a breathtaking 32,000 years to heat the ocean by just this one sea. In short, our influence on our climate, even if we really tried, is minuscule. So it makes sense to ask the question, if the ocean were to be heated by greenhouse warming of the atmosphere, how hot would the air have to get? If the entire ocean is heated by one sea, how much would the air have to be heated by to contain enough heat to do the job? Well, unfortunately for every ton of water there is only a kilogram of air. Taking into account the relative heat capacities and absolute masses, we arrive at the astonishing figure of 4000 C. That is, if we wanted to heat the entire ocean by 1 C, and wanted to do it by heating the air above it, we'd have to heat the air to about 4000 C hotter than the water. And another problem is that air sits on top of water, how would hot air heat deep into the ocean? Even if the surface warmed, the warm water would just sit on top of the cold water. Thus, if the ocean were being heated by greenhouse heating of the air, we would see a system with enormous thermal lag, for the ocean to be only slightly warmer, the land would have to be substantially warmer, and the air much, much warmer, to create the temperature gradient that would facilitate the transfer of heat from the air to the water. Therefore any measurable warmth in the ocean would be accompanied by a huge and obvious anomaly in the air temperatures, and we would not have to bother looking at ocean temperatures at all. So if the air doesn't contain enough energy to heat the oceans or melt the ice caps, what does?